the HouseDog.com Real Estate Show. I'm Brian Crabtree, the May 7th edition. Thank you for tuning in and watching. Coming up, we are number one here in South Carolina on a lot of lists. And on this one, we shouldn't be so proud. Number one in foreclosures for the country. Now number one in evictions, a housing hotspot of evictions as compared to the rest of the nation. That coming up, plus a new move by Zillow, kind of shocking actually, lots of hubris in their ongoing efforts at Zillow to make the real estate industry a dumpster fire. Zillow's been trying for years and they've been succeeding in making the industry a big mess for consumers and agents alike. I'll tell you their latest game in just a few minutes, plus what happens to your credit and to you directly when you apply for a mortgage and have your credit pulled. It's kind of seedy and nasty and you probably won't believe this is legal, but I'll tell you about it coming up and then some. So let's go to uh, a pretty shocking headline. South Carolina eviction hotspot. The counties have the highest rate. The data shows. So if you look at foreclosures, South Carolina is uh, in, the, in the top spot for the nation. Now, let's give that some context. That doesn't mean the wheels are coming off. That just means we have a higher foreclosure rate per capita of our population than much of the rest of the most of all, well, all of the rest of the country, uh, to be exact. And that number is still pretty low compared to 2018, 2019 numbers pre, pre-pandemic. The question might be then, why do we also have the highest eviction rate? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Stuff's too high here. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty much the answer. Uh, there, there's no high tech answer to the to the equation of why the most foreclosures and why the the highest number of evictions as a percentage, and that's because stuff's gotten too high. The cost of living here, I don't think if you put it in a cost of living calculator, is proper is uh, properly indicated. I think um, the the prices here have gotten to be quite uh, northeastern, if you will. Some of the data here on this. Uh, Post and Courier article about the hotspot of evictions. Pretty shocking. The number, um, I got to make sure I get this right because I've read this three times and it still doesn't make sense. Of course, it is written by the Post and Courier, but there have been 400,000 evictions filed in South Carolina since March of 2020. It's about 10% of our population has been in eviction by that number alone. That's insane, right? So then you take a look at the highest rural counties like Dorchester, Dillon, and Cherokee County. Uh, Dorchester County, 29% of the rental uh, stock or housing in that marketplace is in eviction. That's, that's shocking. By the numbers, uh, Charleston County is not quite as bad because of the higher population. There's almost 35,000 filings of eviction. That's 17% of the housing stock available for rent. One in five almost of the homes being rented in Charleston County is under a current eviction filing. Let that sink in. One in five. Just shy of it. Dorchester County's numbers are um, 29%. So almost one in three. One in four, one in three. 400,000 evictions since uh, 2020. Now, this is also known as one of the easiest states to evict. So if you have a rental property and your tenant stops paying in in the general sense in the tri-county, in my experience, you would file an eviction on the, let's say the 10th day of the month. And by the 20th, you either have an eviction hearing to, to do the set out date, or you have a tenant has filed for a hearing so they can argue whatever ridiculous reason they want to come up with. They're not paying their rent, which is usually just a stall tactic. And then about 20 days after that, so 30 to 40 days after the first missed payment, if you file by the 10th, by the middle of the next month, uh, usually in a non-contested eviction, by the end of the month of the missed payment or the middle of the next month, you've got the property back. But if the tenant plays the games, they can drag this out for weeks or months. You know, uh, they cannot drag it out for months in South Carolina without paying some rent to keep their process because they can file an appeal after the order of eviction. But then they have a bond hearing about two weeks later. And that bond says you got to pay this much rent every month or the appeal dies and you're out almost instantly. So that's how this process works. 
So uh, we've got, uh, obviously, we've hit some ceiling here in South Carolina. And particularly, I think, if you look at Dorchester and Charleston County being some of the highest on this, the, the statewide lists uh, for the number of evictions in in the area, if you look at 35,000 active now in Charleston County, we've got a high percentage of the whole state of evictions. So that's a, a real problem. I want to show you something as we move along today. Let me minimize uh, my part of the screen and go to the images. Um, what happens when you pull your credit uh, for a mortgage? This was sent to me by a mortgage client of mine, also a real estate client of mine. And this guy, Alex, with Mortgage One, says, thank you for submitting your mortgage inquiry through TransUnion. We are looking at your file now, and I put together some options for you. Is now a good time for a call? And then you can reply, remove if you wish to cancel this request. So here's how this works. This, first of all, is an illegal text. And I let him have it, like because it's illegal the way it was done. First of all, when you have your credit pulled to buy a car, buy a house, mortgage, or buy a credit card, or get a credit card, or whatever, there's a there's a process that banking institutions, lending institutions can subscribe to called trigger leads. Now we don't do this really at all, or certainly not presently, because what trigger leads do is they send them to another competitor, other than the company that you've just pulled your credit through. And it says to them that you're shopping for a mortgage or a car or whatever. This is why when you start shopping for something, you go into the car dealership and you have your credit pulled on Saturday, but you don't buy a car for the next two weeks, the crap gets bugged out of you with telemarketers. And the thing I really hate about this, this really speaks to the part of like a soapbox issue I have with our society, which is, is this guy right here in this text acted like he was working for the, the mortgage company that my client had just applied to and that he was going to outline the options that were the result of the credit pool. That's just purely, it's kind of evil, actually. It's certainly misleading and it's certainly illegal because it's a misrepresentation in order to confuse consumers. So when you have your credit pool, um, there's so much that can happen called trigger leads that trigger then to other vendors who want to start trying to sell you things. Like when you close on a mortgage, this is inevitable. If you need a mortgage to buy a house, at the end of the mortgage process, you're going to close and a couple of months later, you're going to get what looks like an official letter from the mortgage company that originated the loan trying to get you to subscribe to some sort of title insurance or title lock or uh, mortgage uh, protection or if you disability insurance and then making it sound like you have to do this, right? And most people catch these things. Most people know there, there's something not right about them. Uh, most mortgage clients are a little confused, so they will call me after a mortgage closing and say, is this legit? And I'll say, nope, it's not. We don't send that out. So there's a lot of scams out there. This is one of the reasons, you know, when you look at Rocket Mortgage and Quicken Loans and all these online uh, mortgage companies, Loan Depot, etc. cetera, uh, and you see these advertisings, there's advertising on, on the radio right now for interest rates in the fours, and there's there's no pricing disclosure on it. There's nowhere to go read this from a local company. I think the Tabor Mortgage or something is doing it. And it's, it's just those kinds of advertisements, unless I'm missing something, are illegal. Like they're not legal because they're they're promoting something that is inherently not true. Or if it is true, there are so many conditions to that truth. Got to apply with this credit score. Got to be over 800. Got to put 25 or 30 percent down. Got to pay three points at closing to get the rate bought down to that. Yeah, things you're just not going to do. But once they got you on the phone and they can let you down slowly on all those things, trap, they've got you. Well, what else in the process is going to go nefariously or against your best interest if it starts with misleading crap like Alex here at Mortgage One or get rates today at 4.99 when the best rates you can find is in the mid to high sixes. Like that, there's no magic wand. We're all lending in the same mortgage bonds market. So when you look at people advertising and misleading with the advertising in the mortgage space, that's a big black flag. Like I believe in red flags being enough to run away, but black flags are mortgage companies misleading you with who they are, what products they offer, how cheap the rates are when they're exceptionally below anything else in the market. All that stuff's illegal. 
It's not whether it's illegal or not. It's whether they're getting away with it or not. And it's not the place. It's not the horse to hit your wagon financially because they will sell you up the river. Speaking of selling things up the river, uh, a lot of real estate agents and, and realtors especially are very upset at the National Association of Realtors because of the the settlement um, that occurred for $418 million with a bunch of people suing, saying, that, hey, you were price fixing commissions. And my view is that the realtors organizations uh, and especially the National Association of Realtors can't stand it. They can't help themselves. They've been price fixing commissions in a indirect way for a long time by creating a scenario where you go into the multiple listing service to offer something less than X and it won't allow you because they're setting a minimum standard or making you pay people, right? Or fining real estate agents. I've been fined a few times by the multiple listing service in Charleston over the last 25 years for not doing something the way they think I ought to do it because it's part of the rules and regulations, policies and procedures, right? And so that's in essence a market power. The Association of Realtors Multiple Listing Service is a market power. What that what I mean by that is they control the power of display of listings of, of real estate for sale in the market. And so those of us, me or any other broker, whether it be Carolina One, the number one company in town, and Michael Scarfile and all of his eight brokers and agents who run that company, or little old me here, just a couple of man show, uh, doesn't matter. We have to do what the National Association of Realtors tells us to do or else you'll be blackballed, right? And and they really can't do that exactly, but they certainly make it sound that way. So everybody is in compliance, you know, in the real estate business. And what's happened over the years is, uh, well, people have sued and won. And uh, it turns out that what I've been saying on these shows for two decades is true about the realtors. Uh, they did a 99-year contract with Realtor.com, a for-profit organization, took that away from the Realtors, and then they gave Zillow all the listings. And every time they get challenged by their nefarious behavior at the National Association of Realtors, they cave and they sell us up the river. Uh, and I'm not a member for full disclosure and haven't been for a long time. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I thought I had a screen here with Zillow, but maybe I'll just have to describe it. Zillow's latest game is uh, that they want to uh, set up one-week showings with people. You can go to Zillow. You can request a showing right there live in your living room at 12 o'clock at night and tomorrow morning at 8.30. Uh, someone will be willing to take you out for a couple of weeks and show you uh, the, the properties, right? No obligation. You know, you sign a one week buyer agency agreement and out, off you go and you're showing property and you're looking at property and you don't have all this obligation. You're not stuck with that awful buyer's agent for the next three months. Let me tell you how this is going to go. This is a dumpster fire because now instead of the national association of realtors colluding with big brokers and their small associations at the multiple listing service level, now you've got all these players like Zillow coming in going, we've got the data. We've got 43% of the traffic in real estate, and we're going to direct that traffic to control contracts with brokers. Bad news. If you're doing anything with Zillow as a consumer, trying to sell your home to Zillow, trying to list your home on Zillow for sale by owner on Zillow, uh, buying a home using Zillow for a mortgage, buying a home with a Zillow real estate agent. Listen, the Zillow real estate agents that are out there right now are getting are, are paying $5,000 a month for like three or four leads, okay? And then they close a deal and they don't make much because they're spending all of their money to buy you on Zillow. Or if they're not paying for leads, they're on a program that Zillow does called Zillow Flex. And they charge like a 35 or 40% referral fee. So that means that the agent already can't be flexible when they're a Zillow Flex agent. They're inflexible because they're having to pay a large fee. Here's the other problem with Zillow. When Zillow sends a lead, whether it be for you to see a house randomly, because you just, you can't wait, you gotta go right now, right? And so you go out with that Zillow agent and Zillow is recording them. Zillow is tracking them, it's telling them what to do. They're a Zillow robot agent. And a lot of agents are doing this because it's a way to get business and they, they're on the Zillow Flex program and there's money to be made. And I don't begrudge them for that. But they're having to watch how they represent you. 
Like, I can't tell you the Zello, Zillow sh- stuff is wrong, his estimates wrong, or look at this data, because they're making me call you through a portal for which they can record our conversation and track us and tell me how to sell real estate. Like, I need Zillow. I was here before Zillow. I was one of the first users of Zillow in Charleston. So the point is, is that Zillow's latest move to try to make it really easy for you to click some buttons and go find an agent, boom, and they're going to take you straight to the house. And you're going to sign a one-week buyer's agency. And you've got no obligation. And at any point, you can just get out of paying those fees, right? Because that's what Zillow is trying to sell. They're selling you. You're a commodity that Zillow is selling. So when you use Zillow, everything about what you do is being sold and, and tracked and followed. And then you're being manipulated by altered content and changed behavior because they're telling the real estate agents how to speak. It's literally that bad. So when I say Zillow's ongoing efforts to make a dumpster fire out of the real estate business, I really mean that because they're making a dumpster file fire and a mockery out of the process of you shopping for a home. If you want flexibility, go to, you can come to me or any agent, right? There's good agents all over town. Uh, there aren't that many compared to the whole. There's 8,000 agents. There might be half, you know, half of a thousand or 250. They're really good. The rest of them are just their licensees, right? Well, find those people and go straight to them. And you can negotiate better terms for yourself than if you go through some website like Zillow. And then automatically Zillow's taking a percent of what you're doing. You go buy a house for a million bucks, Zillow's going to make 10 or 15 grand. Or indirectly, they're going to make it because they're charging the agents these thousands of dollars a month as a platform access fee, and you're paying for it. You're enriching Zillow. They make two and a half billion, that's with a B, two and a half billion dollars a year. So just be aware of that. Zillow's ongoing dumpster fire mechanism. Financial advisors. Let me get on a soapbox for a minute. I deal with this uh, off and on over the last 30 almost 30 years in real estate business is that a financial advisor, not the ones I've used personally, not any that my clients have used that I've ever seen, very few financial advisors, some exceptions, like real estate. So if a financial advisor sees you in a market like Mount Pleasant, let's say, where the average house starts at about seven, eight hundred thousand dollars, they'll tell you you need a house for five fifty. Now, I don't think they do that directly on purpose, but they do it because they really want you to invest all of your cash into things that they get a percentage of ongoing forever, right? And so they will blow up a real estate deal when you ask your financial advisor for advice on what house you should buy. Let me give you some empowerment here, folks. You know what you can afford. You you know maybe your financial advisor can advise you as to whether to put down 150,000 or five 500,000, but what price point of house and what monthly payment that you need to purchase is not really the uh, purview of a real estate agent or a financial advisor. It's more of a banker because if you're going with a qualified residential mortgage, a QRM mortgage, you have to be able to afford it. And then there's not just affording it, it's comfortable and afford it. You, some people might be willing to pay three grand a month if they make $6,500 a month. You might want to pay no more than three grand a month and you make 15 grand a month. So lifestyle is the decision. Taking the advice of a financial advisor, you've got it on your screen. The two reasons that they don't like real estate is they can't make commission from the sale of real estate, just financial products. Uh, they make a percentage of the portfolio assets managed. So the more you put into real estate, the less they get. They have a conflict of interest. I'm not saying they're nefarious or, or immoral, but they have a conflict of interest inherently in giving you advice because the way they see it, most financial advisors that I've known well don't own much real estate, if any at all, because they see real estate, number two, as an educational block. It's not their expertise. They understand real estate investment trusts, Because they can put that into their commission-based structure where they make money and sell it to you and you can get a return. But the reality is the management side of a real estate investment trust means that whatever you're uh, investing in, in a REIT, 
There's a management compensation that the company and the fund and the structure is making that takes away from your profits. And then if it's in your retirement account or in your financial portfolio as a percentage of your assets, then your financial advisor is taking a percentage of that. Meaning that if you learn how to self-manage real estate on your own, you're going to make far more money that way. You're going to make far more money self-managing your own real estate because you're going to get the management fees that the fund fees would pay, and you're going to get your financial advisors clip, and that can be upwards of 10 or 15% of the of the cash flow return, right? So if you've got a property that's making $2,000 a month, if you had that same allocation of funds in a REIT, you know, that's automatically going to be about $300 a month cheaper because you got to pay all these fees for all the massive bloated uh, bureaucratic operation of all this. I'm not saying it's bad or that you shouldn't have some in that. What I'm saying is is that it's not necessarily the best way for the small potatoes investor to get started investing money in a, a various different verticals and vehicles and retaining the most return. I don't think for the first time property owner and investor, whether it's buying your primary home, you need to make that based on what you're comfortable paying. What you're comfortable paying, not speculative, but what you're comfortable paying and what you can be approved for. Because you may be more comfortable paying more than you get approved for. That That's... That's a problem, but that can be addressed. What cannot be addressed is you being approved for something and buying something you're not comfortable with. This is not a financial advisor question on your primary residence. And it's also not a financial advisor question on how you go about building a real estate portfolio. That's more of a banker question. That's more of a YouTube series of seminars, watching videos like this where we get into that stuff uh, as an ongoing topic. But it's not for a financial advisor who sells securities as a primary business because they don't understand it. Or if they do, they don't really want you going in that direction because there's no fees for that. All right, so um, let's go back to the screen here. A couple of more things to uh, uh, point out today. First of all, I'm going to get to this $12,000 in down payment assistance, free money. We'll close out on that today, but let me give you an interest rate thought. Rates are down a little bit this week, maybe a quarter. Had bad jobs numbers Friday that sent the mortgage bonds in the right direction for mortgage rates to come down. But there's a lot of people out there right now, shock on the rates, wait for the market to crash. Listen, folks, could the market crash? Absolutely. Anything can happen. But here's the bottom line. We have less inventory than demand as a percentage of what we need. We need 5,000 listings. We got about 3,100 in the Charleston market. That's way too few. There are some segments of the market like second homes on Folly Beach and, you know, million five condos. And, you know, there's certain things that aren't selling as rapidly, but, but they're still not going down in value at the present moment here. So everything's still going up in a middle single digits uh, clip and fashion uh, and even more so uh, unbelievably in Mount Pleasant. But in 1971, the interest rate for mortgage was 7.33. That's roughly where it was on Friday. So uh, mortgage rates haven't been at 7.33 as a market standard. They we touched there and gone through that number, but they haven't been there since 1971 at a fixed, you know, kind of uh, no momentum. You know, we're not going through 7.33, just kind of where they are since 1971. If you waited from that point for interest rates to go down, you wouldn't have purchased a home until 1993. It was 1993 that a standard 30-year fixed rate mortgage finally dropped below 7.33. You would have rented at 100% interest, meaning that your rent payment is 100% going to someone else, not you. There's no percentage of that payment going to you. It's going to the landlord and to and or his bank. So you would, you have rented for 22 years. So let's say you paid 24,000, that's like half a million bucks. About $520,000 give or take a little little bit there uh, that you paid out over 22 years on a $2,000 a month average rental. Uh wow, that would have paid cash for a house or it would have paid off a mortgage. It would have paid off a $250,000 mortgage. So the moral of the story is don't wait to buy real estate. Buy real estate and wait. Now, the marry the house, date the rate statement, I kind of agree with because I think there's always that chance that you can, you know, marry the house, date the rate. Uh, and sometimes if you marry the house and you date the rate and the rate doesn't, you just stick with the rate like you do a bad girlfriend. 
<laughs> maybe maybe it doesn't work out so well because you've married uh, the house and you've got a bad rate and you can't divorce the rate. Uh, but in 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 reality, at some point rates come down. It could be twenty two years, could be twenty two days, could be two point two months. I, I don't we don't know, but we think rates come down a point or two by the end of the year to the first of next year. That seems seems very viable. We get more jobs numbers like we had Friday might go faster than that. But let's say you can afford a seven percent rate right now or six and three quarters but you don't like the payment and you can't get all the house you want. Well, good news. You can always change that later because the estimate of the appreciation of houses by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the Mortgage Bankers Association, National Association of Realtors, all of them on the average home, I think that's um, $400,000 or so. It's about 83 grand over the next five years. That'll offset all the interest. Now, if, if, if appreciation doesn't go up, and everything I just said was BS and you bought a house and you made no money and you spent too much money, but it that's renting, right? If for the next five years you rent in today's market and for a three bedroom pay $3,000, $4,000 a month, which is about entry level for even an apartment in Somerville, I mean, it's not much cheaper than that. So let's say you pay $3,000 over the next five years in rent to an apartment. Well, wouldn't it have been better to have paid $3,400, $3,500 to own a home and at the end of that time, I've built some equity. Even if prices never went up over five years, you're going to build at least twenty five, thirty, forty, fifty thousand in equity at that price point. You're going to have, you're going to have that to work with, right? You're not going to be stuck. Or, or even worse, I know people that every year keep getting kicked out of their rental houses as prices keep going up. They go and rent a house. They get all moved in. They get comfortable. Year comes by, boom. They want to sell the rental property and they have to get up and move again. Like that's the beauty of buying something and, and hanging on to it. All right, finally today, let me get this screen down. Let's talk about free money. How about that? Free, free money. The Palmetto Heroes Program. This is for first responders, conventional loan, better rates. This rate typically is about a half a point better than anything we can price retail in the market. So if rates today are 6.9, this would be about 6.4, 6.5% interest rate, 30 year fixed, and you get 12 grand for free. There's a lot of details to this, but ultimately, if you stay in the house for about a decade, the money's never paid back to 12 grand years to keep. It gets retired yearly at a certain amount. These are for teachers, nurses, certified nurse assistants, first responders, law enforcement, EMT, uh, firefighters, paramedical, uh, paramedics, correctional officers, veterans, active duty, retired military, National Guard. That's the basic list. I have a different program for the real estate side of it. If you purchase with me, then I have another, I mean, you know, a couple $3,000 that gets thrown into the kitty, which means you literally could walk into a house with no closing costs and no down payment. Literally no closing costs and no down payment. Now, what if you own a home right now? As long as that home is closed and sold by the time you buy the next one, like with the $12,000, you can still get the $12,000 down payment assistance in Berkeley and Dorchester County, a few other counties across the state, not Charleston County. You can't have owned a home for the last three years in Charleston County. So this is to promote affordable home ownership for all these people on the side of your screen over here. Uh, and you get 12 grand for free. It's pretty simple. You want to find out more details about that. Just go to the contact us page at therealestateexperts.com or email me, brian at housedog.com. And I'll tell you how to get qualified for this program. And here's the good news. I've been watching the whole video. We talked about the trigger leads and we'll pull your credit without really pulling your credit. It's like a soft pull, which means it doesn't show up as a hard credit inquiry on your credit report. And we get you pre-qualified without even having to pull your credit and putting you down the uh, piranha fest of being a trigger lead for other mortgage people to try to sell you a product you don't need or don't want or don't want to hear about, right? So we can do this with no credit pull and get you qualified. So there's literally nothing but about 15 minutes of your time to invest to see if you qualify for any of these programs and free money that's out there, you can just go to um, crabtreemortgage.com to go straight to the application or reach out to me at therealestateexperts.com. Have a great week. Thanks for watching.